Hello and welcome to Swaraj Conversations. Uh, it's our privilege this episode to have Dr. V. Ananta Nageshwaran uh, on this episode. He's the Dean of IFMR Graduate School of Business at Priya University. He's an influential economic commentator. He's in fact written prolifically on Indian economy for Swaraj, for Live Mint and other publications. So it's our great privilege to have you. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Nageshwaran, I'd like to start with the more obvious thing first. So we are in the middle of an economic downturn, which experts characterize as being a combination of structural and cyclical factors. Uh, but the government seems to be countering it with its own measures. Yeah. The most dramatic one being recently the corporate tax cut. cut yeah. And there's also plans to probably pursue strategic disinvestment right. in PSU in the future with probably BPCL being a primary candidate. So do you see the Modi government in its second term sort of being a bit more aggressive, shifting gears in terms of political economy or is that too early to say that? No, I do think you are right that the Modi government is indeed uh, getting a bit more aggressive about uh, uh, making economic changes in the, in the country. And you are right that uh, we are in the middle of a structural come cyclical slowdown. And uh, it is uh, definitely not an economic downturn as much as a growth slowdown. But nonetheless, it is important enough to focus minds and that is what it has done to the right. government. To that extent, it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, the corporate income tax cut is an illustration of the fact that the government is willing to take radical measures. Especially in the, in the context of the remark that uh, Mr. Rahul Gandhi made in 2015 about this government being a suit book ki sarkar, right. which in my opinion had bogged the government down so much that it was going out of its way to avoid being seen as pro-business. Right. So I think the, the tax cut that the government has given to corporate income tax uh, payers is uh, a very clear sign that it is no longer shackled by that particular remark. Right. It is willing to break out of it. So I'm I'm attaching greater significance to that uh, right. messaging rather than the tax cut per se, whether it has got an impact in the near term or not, to me is less consequential than the fact that the government is saying, I don't want to be bogged down by that charge. I will do what it takes to revive the economy. Right. That is the messaging I get. And therefore, that is a signal of an aggressive intent to fix the economy. Right. Uh, what would you say about uh, the critics of the move? who basically say that this is a supply side measure and that we are not addressing the demand problem that is plaguing the economy. So what would your take be on that? Again, I think it may be right that in the short run, the impact of this on the economy may be limited from a pure tax cut point of view, whether the corporate uh, uh, taxpayers will save this or use it to reduce their uh, leverage, right. which also is a good thing in a way. If they use it to reduce their indebtedness, that's a good thing. They repay the banks right. and the banks can lend that money. So I can't even say that if they don't use it to pass on uh, the benefits to their employees in terms of higher bonuses or reduce the prices of their goods, but simply use it to improve their balance sheet. Why can't that be considered a short term uh, demand inducing measure? Because right. it will leave more money in the hands of the bankers to make loans. Be that as it may, even if it is a medium term supply side measure, right. I still think that the messaging that the corporate sector cannot no longer feel that this government is in intrinsically against us. Removing that feeling is in itself a very, very enormously significant message and that to me is both a short run and a medium run demand boost. I see. I see. Uh, the RBI and yeah. the MPC have sort of faced uh, criticism. Uh, for putting inflation targeting at the center of its policy right. and for even keeping interest rates high. That's right. Um, what's your take on that actually? Is that to, a, to an extent that criticism is justified, right. especially if you look at 2017 after the demonetization. Now, we don't have to go into whether the demonetization was the right thing to do or not. But from the RBI point of view, it was done. The government had done it. Now, how do you respond as a central banker? Right. So uh, I think uh, any measure that withdraws liquidity from the economy is basically going to have a contractionary effect. So the central bank should be expected to offset that. Right. So the RBI under Mr. Urjit Patel reduced interest rates only by 25 basis points in August right. of 2017 from 6.25 to 6% and then increased the repo rate twice in 2018. To a degree, the increase in 2018 could be justified because the US Federal Reserve was raising interest rates. Right. Rupee was weakening 
and india still has a lot of short term foreign currency loans to repay right so every uh, uh, every uh, uh, dollar every rupee um, weakness in the indian rupee against the dollar increases the foreign currency uh, loan repayment burden right so i can understand to some extent what they did in 2018 but 2017 was a missed opportunity by the rbi to provide support to the economy that needed support in right. the light of demonetization in the light of the implementation of the goods and services tax because both these measures had increased economic uncertainty right and that would naturally have a dampening effect on the economy and the central bank could have offset that Right. But I wouldn't attach too great a blame on RBI because a slowdown in a vast and complex country like India is parented by many factors. To ascribe all of that right. to the central bank is both wrong and as well as I would say uh, opportunistically misguided. Right, right. Uh, zooming out of the country a little bit and looking at the global situation. Yeah. Now Trump's trade war obviously has right. disrupted the. global entrenched supply chain right, right. and uh, some also see an opportunity in here to sort of attract capital yes uh, into india yes so do you also see that as an opportunity and how much of an opportunity is that no i think the corporate tax cut more than the reduction in the top tax rate right. the uh, the 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 incentive given for new units to be set up right. after october 2019 and which will commence production before 2023 will attract a tax rate of 15% right i think that is clearly a, a move aimed at uh, taking advantage of the businesses leaving china right uh, so that clearly is a measure that is focusing on that opportunity but that is one aspect of how you take advantage of the the not only the trade war even without the trade war china would be losing competitiveness because it is becoming a middle income economy right from a low income economy and naturally it will no longer be as competitive as it used to be so supply chains global supply chains leaving china would have happened regardless of the trade frictions right. with the united states so how do we take advantage of that one is the uh, corporate uh, tax break given for new units being set up the other thing is we need to encourage scale efficiencies in the country we don't have units of large scale in this country right. they are they are sporadic and most of our uh, tax and other policies are geared to actually discouraging scaling up right because most of the fiscal and other concessions are withdrawn the moment units cross a particular threshold so we haven't managed the threshold effect very well at all in fact our um, our well meaning incentives over the years not just this government but over the years have actually disincentivized firms from growing right and that to me is the biggest uh, deterrent to india competing with china and grabbing some of the market share so right. tax incentives only one small part of it how do we create the policy framework that encourages scale that is not anti big right that is a very important part of uh, taking advantage of the global shifts in supply chain right and since you're a long time china watcher yeah. I, i i must ask um how do you think china itself would be looking to tackle the headwinds it is facing for the last couple of years look i mean china as i said uh, was a great uh, light manufacturing country right. uh, and with uh, amazing export success it followed the template set by the rest of east asia it gave lot of government support not with the and certainly it created import barriers in the country from for foreign goods coming into china but it made sure that its companies were and their products were export competitive and that is a very good east asian template successful template that china followed which india had it so sometimes we all question government giving subsidies import protection to businesses which is per se not a problem right but what is it that the government extracted in return right. from the companies efficiencies export competitiveness so in fact the i would strongly recommend policy makers to read joe studwell's book how asia works right and that is a very good development template and i think therefore china did that very well until now but now china is clearly facing short term headwinds and much of it depends on how successfully it de leverages the economy it's highly indebted economy right. from 2005 onwards china's growth has been driven more by debt than by productivity improvements whereas pre 2005 it was the opposite right and therefore china has to go through a period of slowdown consolidation and some strain before it can sort of think of moving from middle income to a upper income country
if you look at the policy measures that have been introduced since 2014 could you point out to some that you would consider say self-inflicted policy errors with the benefit of hindsight sure, obviously sure. i would point out to three one is of course demonetization especially the manner in which it was executed right and second uh Having done demonetization, when they introduced the goods and services tax, the emphasis should have been more on simpler structures rather than revenue maximizing structure. Right. So the design of the GST could have been improved, especially after the government did demonetization because you already created a huge uncertainty. Right. And GST was another uh, structural measure which would also in the short run boost uncertainty. Therefore, more attention should have been paid to making it simpler right. and easier to comply with. And having the kind of technological backbone and the preparation required to make it simpler to comply with. Especially given that the government's focus is on prosecution for failure of compliance, then you should have made compliance easier. So right. the design of GST more than the rates per se. And the third thing is, this whole emphasis on tax revenue collection, right. which uh, rightfully earned this government a lot of ire even from its own supporters on tax terrorism. And the fourth one, I would say, failing to use the banking crisis as an opportunity to prepare the Indian banking system for the next century. Right. And it need not necessarily mean dismantling the public sector banking framework, right. but a lot of reforms could have been done even while keeping public sector as a dominant uh, portion of the banking system. So I would I would mention these four, not three, these four as the key failures. Right. With respect to banking, they have been front-loading recapitalization. Uh, That's a very small element of right. the banking reform. Then if, even if I give you uh, enough money to lend, at the same time, if I'm going to question you, let's say you are the public sector bank, I'm the government of India, I have given you capital. Right. But if, if, if you make loans and then I'm going to come back, if the loan fails, if I'm going to come back and uh, unleash uh, CVC and CBI and CAG on you, right. would you make a loan? You wouldn't. That is why, in fact, that is why I also question people who are asking RBI to cut interest rates. Right. If RBI cuts interest rates, will the mac will the banks make industrial loans? No, they won't because a, the industrial sector's balance sheets are still fragile, and some of the reasons that the bad loans get generated are still intact. I.e., right. the pricing of water, the pricing of power, the inability of state electricity boards to pay them. Right. So these things make the projects unviable. And therefore, the fountain of NPA still remains. Given that, even if I recapitalize the banking system, why would they lend? And then on top of that, there is this fear that I could be pulled up for fraud, even if the bank loan is a genuine failure. Right. So without changing the regulatory architecture governing public sector banks, recapitalizing or RBI uh, cutting interest rates wouldn't necessarily help. And that is a failure. So recapitalization is inevitable. You have to do it. Right. But uh, if that is not having an impact, you must then dig deeper as to why it is not having an impact. Right. The answer to that is not forcing them to lend through a loan mailer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, finally, the last question. Now, things like the corporate tax break, yes. uh, would sort of affect the, the budget math, the fiscal yeah. math yeah. for the government this year. How do you think they should look at it, it say for this year? No, I think, look, if the budget impact is uh, there, it is there. And I think uh, the government need not be very apologetic about it because this is a, this is a, is, is, is a slowdown generated uh, consequence right and the moment the economic growth picks up the tax revenues will again pick up but use the opportunity to prepare the tax system to make it equitable fair and reasonable so that when right. the economic growth reappears then the revenues will automatically come i i always say that the uh, the, the revenue should not be the main product of main goal of economic activity it should be a byproduct right if it becomes the main purpose of economic activity then economic activity will become a bygone product right and that is what is happening in the last several years so i think I, we shouldn't worry about the short term slippage in fiscal deficit is my short answer and I know uh, Western governments took their fiscal deficit to 10% of GDP after the 2008 crisis. And then they were able to bring it down later when the, right. when the, economy, when the economy recovered. So we should uh, not worry about it too much in the short run. And in any case, uh, investors around the world don't have uh, too many opportunities to invest in. Every country has zero or negative interest rates. Right. And even if we have a higher fiscal deficit in one year, but in the process, if we have made the economy more stable, I think it is worth paying that price. Great. 
uh, thank you so much for giving us your time and thanks for You're the wonderful insights. Thank yeah. you. That's all we've got for you today on Suraja Conversations. Catch you in another one.